I'm Kier from In Defense Of, a podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Here, we're a bunch of geeks talking about geeky things. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven. But what if I'm in the mood for a T-Swift story? Chris. I've heard the X is going to give it to you. And SP. That's how we roll on Gonna Geek on Monday night. We get crazy! Gonna Geek Productions presents the official GunnaGeek.com show. episode 224 of the official geek.com show i am steven john drew with me of course is the wonderful chris farrell it is true x is gonna give it to you we also have with us stargate pioneer it's monday night it's time to get crazy with the x yes indeed we are here today with an all-new episode of the official geek.com show back we're re reunited and it feels semi okay is is that legally distinct marginal at best is what i was going to say okay okay so if you are joining us on the live stream or on the video side of things first off thank you for checking that out we do have a full video companion available at www.genageek.com or live at geeks.live every monday at 8 45 p.m eastern time you may notice some changes the old layout the old feel was like, I don't know, it was developed uh, January 2016, 15, somewhere around there. It, it's like, it's several, several years old. So, surprise! Is it time to change? <laughs> uh, you know, I have to say that for me, it is a little bit surprising that I would actually put effort into to doing anything. Let's be honest here, because I am just a complete, complete useless person, right? Did your wife ban you to the basement and you had nothing better to do? Is that how, how this happened? It's pretty, pretty much how it goes, yes. But thank you for joining us live. Uh, Chris, I just want to say that uh, you, the moment you dropped that X line, I knew the, it was going in the intro one day. I knew it was going in at one point. So it, the, the, you're now, it's your legacy. My legacy is a line from Exhibit the Rapper, who's best <laughs> known for pimping people's rides, is what you're saying. Absolutely. And uh, SP, I will just say that uh, we we are crazy. We are very crazy. You're cray cray. Yeah, uh, you're going to leave that as Chris's last bachelor legacy because you know <laughs> by the time you change this he's going to be married so this is his last this is his bachelor this is the last segment of his singlehood and that's going to be it i hope you're happy chris yeah well, really it just depends on whether i screw that up between now and may 2019 so there's plenty of time for me to screw it up and ruin my relationship so that it is not my last bachelor related quote on the show for you oh, 2019 see i thought it was 2018 2019 yeah you got time <laughs> yeah i got time i can screw this up still yeah well in any case uh we are going to go ahead and get into the news but before we get there i just want to take a moment to remind you that we're part of the gonna geek network there's a bunch of amazing amazing geeky content over on the gun geek network and we've got lots of new members so please do check that out that's gonna geek network.com lots of awesome shows and also if you are lucky if you are so lucky you might just find there is there is a little bit of stargate pioneer over there you just gotta hunt it's a little hard to find him a little bit <laughs> all right let's go ahead and roll into the news here we go Sometimes in life, we ask ourselves, George, why did you not change the Star Wars deal so that the expanded universe had to stay? And today we have that answer for you. Isn't that right, Chris? Well, sort of. So let's go back in time a little bit here and let's talk about the Star Wars expanded universe. For those that aren't familiar, before Disney 
acquired Lucasfilm and Lucasfilm Limited, all of their assets. There was a wide book and comic set of series that basically told the story of everything that happened after Return of the Jedi. It was, oh, I don't even know how many books it was, but I had bought and read almost all of the books in this series before I'd given up for a while. And then the acquisition happened and they rolled out and said, oh yeah, all those books you read, they're not canon anymore. We're going to change that and put those so that they're in our legends line, meaning that they're just alternate takes on things that happen in canon. And for someone like myself, who'd spent a lot of time and money uh, reading all of the old Star Wars books, it kind of put me off for a little bit. And I've recovered now. I'm back to being a Star Wars fan. The hurt of my expanded universe experience going away has uh, ceased. And just recently, we found out why exactly the expanded universe was thrown out. So during a recent interview, Lucasfilm story group member Leland Chi, who oversees the Holocron, which is Lucasfilm's official Wikipedia for Star Wars, offered an in-depth explanation for why the EU was ditched, and he pins it directly on a desire to bring Chewbacca back after he was killed in the books. Here's the quote. For me, it came down to simply that we had killed Chewbacca in the legends. A big moon had fallen up on him. Part of that original decision was Chewbacca because he can't speak and just speaks in growls. He was a challenging character to write for in novel, novels. Publishing had decided they need to kill someone, and it was Chewbacca. But if you have the opportunity to bring Chewbacca into a live-action film, you're not going to deprive fans that. There's no way I'd want to do an episode 7 that didn't have Chewie in it and have to explain that Chewbacca had a moon fall on his head. And if we're just going to overturn a monumental decision like that, Everything else was really just minor. Everything else was really just minor in comparison. So really, they wanted Chewie back. That's what it all comes down to. Chewbacca was important to them. And if you read the New Jedi Order, the very first book of it was called Vector Prime, I believe. It was by R.A. Salvatore. And Chewbacca goes out like a badass. He saves Anakin Solo, the youngest Solo child's life, throws him on the Millennium Falcon as a moon is crashing down on the planet. He knows he's not going to be saved, so he literally turns around raises his arms up in the sky and yells at the moon as it falls down on the planet and kills him. It was a pretty cool death scene. And while it was a cool death scene, I kind of understand why you might throw out the EU to bring back a character like Chewbacca. I I'm okay with it now in retrospect. If you'd talked to Chris about four years ago, I was like, oh, this is stupid. Why'd they do this? Where's my EU? Now I kind of see the reasoning behind it. And while I miss those stories still, I think it's kind of worth it to continue the tale of Chewbacca. Well, of course they want Chewbacca back because they're killing everybody else that was in the original trilogy. Chewbacca is the only one that can continue with or without the main actor because he's wearing a suit. So, of course, they want Chewbacca still around. And I realize you're talking about the EU, realize you're talking about the books and you're not talking about the movies, but they want everything to be one in the same because they want to sell, sell, sell. And yeah. Chewie, I, I gotta like him, but I want my original trilogy trio back too. And it's not gonna happen. I gotta say that from my perspective, I have very limited EU knowledge. And, you know, the thing that I think is interesting is, is the way they dump most of it. I understand it was probably better to just, just get rid of it all so that it's, it's a very clear, definitive um starting point but there's some stuff they probably could have kept however with that said uh if it came down to chewy being dead or not being dead obviously not being dead in my opinion is the better decision and so give lucasfilm credit right now they're taking a lot of things from the old expanded universe and folding it into the universe now like in star wars rebels they introduced the tie defender which was one of the well-known starfighters that was introduced in the eu they brought grand admiral thrawn in who was a character created by timothy zahn in the uh, Heir to the Empire trilogy. So they're starting to take the things that did work well in the EU and find ways to fold them into canon. So just because something you loved is gone in there, it doesn't necessarily mean it won't turn up at some point. It might not be exactly how you remembered it, but it'll be close. Okay, so let me ask you this, Chris. Can we make a EU of the Gunna Geek Network? An expanded universe? So... What we need to do is set up a Reddit over at like reddit.com slash r slash gunna geek and set up the gunna geek fan fiction Reddit thread there where people can create their expanded universe of the gunna geek.com show and the gunna geek network. So yes, we can do that. We just need to build a Reddit first. 
Okay, so what is going to be the first side story? In my opinion, it should be all about how Stargate Pioneer was not actually the director of SNASA. <gasps> no, it's all, it's all going to be how Stargate Pioneer gets outed as the director of SNASA and assistant director Suncast takes over. And in order to take SP out, <laughs> they trick him into going onto the surface of the moon and then drop another moon on him just like they did to Chewbacca. It'll, you'll get to go out like a badass SP. You'll turn around, you'll be like, and you'll have fun. I quit. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of quitting, um, you know what? I just got to say this, that uh, in this week's interesting Canadian news, there was something that happened. We are not as polite as one would think. Did you know that, Chris Farrell? Did you know that? I sort of did. I've known you for a few years, and as you saw in the Christmas special, you can be pretty mean to us. <laughs> they kind of hoard the maple syrup from time to time, too. That's true. I do, I do like the syrup, eh? Yes. Anyways, Canada is representing, and we're representing in the world of spam! That's right. There was a recent legal action taken against a certain Brandon Lucas Apple that was a Canadian and charged behind a series of attacks that happened on Twitch. That's right, Chris's beloved Twitch. And what ended up happening was during these attacks, more than 1,000 broadcasts were um, distributed through the network, and it essentially allowed a bunch of spamming to happen. According to the court documents, Mr. Apple runs a service that lets people send a lot of junk messages and spam, as well as email messages to other other services within uh, Twitch. So I thought that was so, kind of interesting to see that that lawsuit was brought against a Canadian. Wait a minute. Were, were a thousand broadcasts distributed? Because that would be a good thing. Or were they disrupted? Oh, sorry. They were disrupted. Uh, I uh, thought, okay. okay, you're correct. I, I did misread my own <gasps> article. No. SP yeah. is correct. SP is uh, correct. No, they uh, were. Okay. So, sorry. A thousand broadcasts were disrupted. Uh, I'm sure it was disrupted by a thousand um, distributed spam messages. Probably more than a thousand. <laughs> so, Chris, let me ask you this. Uh, where's your Twitch now? My Twitch? It's still on Twitch.tv. In fact, it's rebroadcasting tonight's episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. Okay, sweet. Uh, is I, it Twitch or is it Justin TV? I keep getting the two mixed up. Justin TV shut down like four years ago. <sighs> okay, so seriously though, uh, I will say that um, it's, it's actually kind of nice to see legal action happening against these Twitter spammers. Now, I do know that in Canada we've got some, some tougher spamming laws and whatnot, and that's something that uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Canada does have that. However, uh, what do we think is going to happen here? I, I think it's not really going to have much of a worldwide impact. It'll just be another guy that does the same thing. I think Canada's internet access will be throttled because of all the spam that is coming out from it. Now I want spam. I'm hungry. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Do you want it fried spam. or do you want it straight out of the can? Do you want it baked? Do you want it in something like meatloaf? What kind of spam are you in for? Fun, fun, Stephen, child Stephen John Drew story. Uh, one camping trip, for some reason, we ended up with a can of spam. And none of us liked it because we were all kids and it was spam and spam's gross. So it went in the fire that we had. And yeah, the next day it was still sitting there. <laughs> it was still in the fire pits. <laughs> the logs were burnt, but the fire, the spam was still there. <laughs> So when the apocalypse happens because of Skynet comes alive, which is going to happen soon, you're going to be wishing for Twinkies and spam. I always wish for Twinkies. So what's new? I've been watching the hundred, by the way, from the beginning, because I totally missed out on that whole thing. You know, it's available out on Netflix or whatever. So I started watching it. And of course, they're coming down to Earth after whatever it was, 72, 82 or years and uh, the radiation stuff and you know they're looking for food you would want spam you would it, you'd eat it so, something about a hundred grand bar I, I i lost you after you said hundred grand bar mm -hmm. candy grand <laughs> all right you're talking about things coming down from the sky tell me why is the sky falling sp the sky is falling the sky is falling well apparently 
Suncast should know this more than just about anybody around the show right now. But a small meteor packed a seismic punch in Michigan last week. This is via an article via space.com written by Elizabeth Howell on January 19th. So this meteor, the day after we recorded last week, caused a huge fireball in the skies above southern Michigan Tuesday night, January 16th. And it was only a few feet in size, a lot of researchers have said, but its speed was enough to shake the ground as it exploded in the atmosphere. Now, the meteor registered as a 2.0 magnitude seismic event, and this was according to an alert issued with the National Weather Service. This was an explosion in the atmosphere, not an earthquake, and it produced a seismogram that is very different from what you get from a small regional earthquake. And this is a statement that Larry Ruff, who's a seismologist at the University of Michigan, said. He went on to say seismologists who are experienced enough can tell that it's not an earthquake because the character is very different. How do you think he knows that? Well, Ruff oversees a seismic station at the Ann Arbor University of Michigan campus and has been working there since 1982. So for over 35 years, I think the guy knows what he's doing. And he's never seen an atmospheric event produced this strong of a seismic signatures. So researchers at the university, I don't know why the University of Michigan gets to be the experts in this all of a sudden, but anyway, researchers at the University of Michigan said that an object of one meter or about 3.2 feet in size hits the earth every few months. A 10 meter or about a 33 foot object strikes every few years or decades and a 100 meter or 330 foot or roughly the size of a football field object roughly hits the earth every few thousand years. So another Michigan professor, Michael Luman, said that the object in the atmosphere, also called a bolide, was much smaller than the 56-foot object that shattered over Chelnabysk, Russia, in 2013, and that injured hundreds of people and caused property damage. I'm sure you've all seen the dash cams and the video event of that in 2013. And by the way, dash cams became famous after this particular event in 2013. But there was also, and I don't know if you guys have heard of this or not, but in on June 30th, 1909, in Siberia, there was the Tungutska event, which was highlighted in the original Cosmos series that Carl Sagan did. So I don't know if you've seen the original Cosmos or not. I know they just recently redid it, but the original Cosmos series highlighted this event and it produced about 185 times more energy than the Hiroshima atomic bomb with some estimates going even higher. And seismic rumbles were even observed from that event as far away as the UK. And unfortunately, we don't have any first hand accounts from this because it was so remote. Matter of fact, it took them 27 years to send somebody to actually study the event. So there you go. And the report came out even later than that in uh, 1938. So uh, there you go. That is what happened in Michigan and what could have happened as happened in Tunuska. So yeah, we're getting bombarded by meteorites. It happens all the time. Guys, the sky's falling. I'm scared. I'd be. You know, there's a China, Chinese space station about to come down on Steven's house anyway right now. That's just because he's stealing their tech. I, I got the new overlay done for the video show. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm content. Make sure you send me a copy before that space mm-hmm. station hits your house. Store them on the uh, line somewhere. Fair. Ma- you know. Maybe on OneDrive. <laughs> okay, so SP, let me ask you this. Ask. Have you ever, ever personally felt a space-based rumble? Space object-based rumble? No, I've felt actual Earth-based earthquakes. I've felt them in Texas. I've felt them in Virginia. It was even in California during a small earthquake. So yeah, I've felt earthquakes, but I've never felt a seismic event from a meteor explosion yet, unless I happen to feel this one, but I don't think I did. Fun fact, uh, and it's really not fun by any means, but uh, where I live we, in the western part of British Columbia, we, we are prone to earthquakes. We're in an uh, earthquake zone, so we actually regularly get seismic activity. Sometimes it's more felt than others. Uh, I remember a couple, like the one that happened, um, that took out a large portion of, of C or did not a large, took out, but did a lot of damage to Seattle. Uh, I remember that one. So oh, I, yeah. 
the yeah. one that that uh, uh, collapsed the aqua or valid duck or whatever they yeah, call that in highway mid aughts, right? Whatever that was, I think, or early, or maybe it was late nineties. I don't know, somewhere around there. What? what? It was the double decker bridge that collapsed. Was that what it was? Yeah. yeah, and there was also a double decker bridge that collapsed in San Francisco too. So I felt some of these, and that's what I'd like to know: is like, do they feel any different from an impact like this? It, does it does it feel any different than that? I wish I knew. I don't know. Apparently, the seismograph is different, but I mean, if the Earth's shaking, the Earth's shaking. I mean, you're not going to be able to tell much difference other than the magnitude. Usually, the Earth's shaking because, uh, oh, never mind, it's not true. Yeah, so we, we actually we got it's not true. We got an earthquake in North Central West Virginia, where I live, probably five six years ago. Now the funny thing is, I was in the restroom, so I left. I leave the restroom and I walk back into the office. I'm like, "Where is everyone? What's going on?" And then my boss comes in and goes, "Hey, we're evacuating." And I went, "Why are we evacuating?" He goes, "Didn't you feel the earthquake?" And I went, "Oh, so that's what that was. I just thought the dude next stall flushed the toilet." <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is the thing. A lot of these small earthquakes, and, and I'm not exaggerating when I say say we get regular seismic activity, but that's all you think that it was. We had one a few weeks ago that uh, some people felt, and and my wife's like, "I thought there was a large truck outside." <laughs> yeah, that was all she she felt. I didn't even feel it where I was. So it's it's. You don't really know unless it's a big event. And even in a big event, you're not like a, a massive event, but something that is reasonable, it still takes a little bit to process and really realize what it is. Chris, you're going to be like that one guy in Independence Day that comes out of the, the office and turns around and sees this big spaceship about to explode. That's going to be you just totally well, oblivious about the world fair. events around you. And oh, it was some guy in the toilet flushing something. It wasn't a spaceship. <laughs> to be fair, the pipes in this building were not great, despite it being like less than 10 years old. So anytime it flushed, like everything in the bathroom shook for some reason. It was not automatic flushers. And it was literally in the center of the building. So the most stable part of things. Whereas had I been at my desk, which was on the edge of the building, I probably would have felt said earthquake that we then had to evacuate for. And our evacuation spot was the top of the parking garage. Explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> that tells you how common earthquakes are in North Central West Virginia. Our evacuation location was the top part of the parking garage. And then they sent us home and we had to send our buddy in to go get the car that we carpooled in out of the bottom floor of the garage to meet us outside because we weren't all going in Sacrificial there. lamb. Go, you go get exactly. the guy. Aren't you supposed to like go underneath like a door frame or right next to a large piece of furniture as the building collapses around you to create that little cavity? Yeah, I think the Mythbusters just proved that. Door frames are an appropriate place to take shelter. You're supposed to also try to get out of a building. Like, we, we do earthquake drills here, even from yeah, elementary school upwards. So it's it's a thing. And and the top of a parking garage is not a smart idea. So I'm just going to say no. that. What if you're outside and the earth, like, splits right underneath you? What are you supposed to do then? You'd be, like, stuck in the homes, like, in Florida when they get sucked down with those sinkholes. It, it, that's fake. The, the earth doesn't well, just open like that. Let's put it this way. I'm less concerned about the earthquakes here. I've lived in West Virginia for 15 years and had one earthquake, so I'm not concerned well, about West earthquakes. Well, in West Virginia, you Sinkholes have to worry about the freaking coal burning in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's over-exaggerated. We mined all that coal out already. What do you know? There's a whole town that's evacuated that's still burning. It's been burning for like 70 years. <sighs> that's fake news, SP. That is not fake. Oh, my God, you two. There are homes that get swallowed up in Florida for sinkholes. And there is a town that was evacuated because it's been burning for decades in West Virginia. You guys are nuts. It's fake news. Where are you getting these alternative facts from, SP? Oh, my God. This is why our government shut down. <laughs> because I'm in charge. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our extra, extra section where we'll start off with an interesting little piece here that we've got from, of course, Google. If you've ever wondered what Google prototypes look like, what you should do is head on over to geeks.link slash proto. That way, I won't make you spell. Geeks.link slash proto. And you can see a awesome awesome picture that was posted of a bunch of different google prototypes that's right this past week there was uh one of the google developers posted um sorry designer ivy ross posted some pictures 
that were taken throughout various projects. And so you can see some different prototypes of different Google products. Like there's a Google uh, Home Mini in there. There's some weird versions of the Pixel. It's really just kind of neat to see. And as someone who likes Google products, loves prototypes, and just really likes to see things that were kept under wraps let out, uh, I, this just tickled my right geeky itch. So check that out. That's geeks.link slash proto if you want to see some interesting things as well. There's a board, uh, a design board picture, which was kind of neat because there's uh, uh, some various concept art for the daydream. And um, there was one that had a very large nose piece. Uh, maybe that was for the 40. I don't know. But uh, I, I'm just glad my daydream does not have a nose piece. I think I see an iPhone X in there too. It's probably, I'll uh, remind everybody that the original Google Pixel looked a ton like an iPhone, so I'm not surprised they had something that looked a lot like an iPhone X. All right, next, let's talk briefly here about how uh, there might be a discontinuation with Apple and an iPhone X. Who wants to take this <gasps> one? I guess I'll take this one since Steven doesn't want to be the Apple hater today. I'll take over the role <laughs> for him. Uh, go ahead. So I, I like to read tech blogs for a couple minutes while I eat my lunch today. And one of the stories I saw, and I forgot to send to these guys until later in the afternoon, was an article over on Boy Genius Report, who's pretty pro Apple, for lack of a better term. And they said right now that it looks like Apple has plans to continue the, excuse me, discontinue the current iPhone 10 model once it introduces the 2018 lineup model later this year. This comes courtesy of a, re a reputed analyst by the name of Ming-Chi Kyo. I probably mispronounced that. I apologize. Who relays that the new next gen iPhone lineup will have two brand new devices with edgeless displays, one at 6.5 inches with an OLED display and the other at 6.1 inches with LCD saying the 5.8 inch iPhone 10 will be discontinued. And why is that the case? Because the notch is not very popular over in China. That's one of the big concerns right there is it's not popular here. Well, that's true. The iPhone 10 adoption rate is not super high compared to what you have with the eight because the hardware is pretty much the exact same. The difference is you get face ID and a pretty OLED screen. And I don't know about you guys. It's probably not worth the $200 difference. I mean, Suncast can probably attest to this. He just bought a new iPhone eight and I'm sure he weighed the pros and cons between the eight line and the 10 line. I sure did. We've spoken about this on this podcast like three or four months ago. I was agonizing. Well, should I get a 10? Should I get an A plus? I finally went with A plus. I'm like, I don't know what the 10's given me that the eight plus is not given me. And yeah, I know there's differences, but it's not good enough for a $200 upgrade. I don't think the thing's worth as much as I paid for it to begin with because it is literally an iPhone six. S S S S plus or whatever. So yeah, I, I think that Apple totally botched this last round of stuff and I'm really hoping they get something better next time around because I know a lot of people are still hanging around to their six and successes. The whole battery thing is included in that. And I, I think people are going to continue to hang on to their old tech until there is really something to upgrade for. I actually have two theories on this. Number one, the first is the price tag. The price tag, I think, is um is hard to get people to buy in on. And I think Chris nailed it right now where he mentioned that uh, there's that $200 difference. He mentioned it. SP, you mentioned it, too, when you talked about your choices. And there's a lot of people I know who just have troubles justifying that extra price tag. So I think that that's a, a bit of a reason why it might not be so appealing for them to continue that. My second conspiracy theory is the look. I just made the comparison how the Google Pixel 1 looked like an iPhone. And the reason I made that comparison is because the iPhone has a look. The X does not look like an iPhone. So even though you're getting more real estate and everything, it's, it's not 10. that brandable. Sorry, the 10. It's not that brandable image that everybody recognizes everywhere. So... I think that there's a certain amount of marketing leverage that you get by having a specific look and the 10 does not have that look. I just had to mention that because I didn't want to have the urge to go going to give it to you every time you say that. <laughs> 
God. I don't think the screen is big. I mean, I, I know the resolution and everything, but look, I'm old and I need something big to look at. And that 5.8 inch versus the six and a half inch thing. I'll take the six and a half. I'll take the bigger thing. I'm like, I'm going to be like the grandparents pretty soon. I'm going to be a grandparent pretty soon. Nothing to announce, but yet, by the way, but I'm going to need the, the big, huge books, you know, with the letters, the size of this freaking minifig that's on my stanchion right here so yeah well, i I'm need just, a bigger screen just gonna come clean here for those of you who aren't watching the video side of things uh one of the new elements that i have on the video show is that when we're on the the screen with all three of us it has our names below our frame that's not for the listener that's actually for sp to remind himself of who he is so that way i don't have to do that during the show <laughs> It's happened once or twice. <laughs> uh, okay, so anyways, I'm interested to see what happens with this. Uh, I did want the direction of the 10 to kind of hold on because I really like that that direction for iPhone. You know, um, just some of the things that they they added and they changed. But uh, it's interesting to see that it might be going away. Finally, in our extra extra news section, I just want to quickly mention this one here. Those of you who are familiar with audiobooks might be familiar with a certain service called Audible. Audible is a business that is a company uh, that is owned by Amazon. It's a division of Amazon. And the rumor is that apparently Google might be getting into the audiobook game. There was a banner recently spotted on the Google Play Store that teased audiobooks coming soon. So that is very interesting to see because Audible is one of the leaders, if not the leader, in audiobooks. So not surprised Google's getting into this. I think that it's just also another uh, instance of them really trying to go head to head with Amazon. They want to they get a bit of that Amazon pie however they can. And we all know the ensuing battle happening between Google and Amazon. So there you go. Chris, will you get your audiobooks through Audible or through the Google Play? You know, I don't actually do a lot of audiobooks, but I'm going to get my books from Audible because I want Audible to sponsor us. So you could go to audible.com slash gunna geek potentially and get promo stuff. So Audible, if you're listening, feel free to sponsor the gunna geek.com <laughs> show. Okay. By the way, in the chat, I got to give this a special shout out for all you podcasters out there. Uh, Suncast says, is Google going to give their audiobook service the same love and care as their podcasts? Oh, those of you who have Androids and have had Ouch. fun looking at the way that Google has handled their podcast side of things. It's a funny jab, but it's kind of sort of true. Is that what's going to happen? Right? Like, you know, Google doesn't have the best track record as far as pushing new ideas forward so who knows we'll see sp you listen to audiobooks sometimes don't you from time to time it's actually been a while but yeah i'd go with audible just because i'm used to them can you do audible books on echoes like that's a genuine question yes you can yeah huh. matter of fact it already i mean there's freebies that you can get through there anyway the interesting move that amazon has is since they own audible and they own and they sell ebooks and audiobooks and have tablets and devices that do this they have a method to basically sync all of these up so if i'm listening to an audible book in my car when i get home i can then pick up my kindle and it will sync to where i left off on the audiobook i can keep reading it and then the next day when i get in the car to go to work it will sync to where i stopped reading my kindle and start playing from there. So they've got a really robust system for this. It's just a matter of, I got too many podcasts to listen to. I don't have time <laughs> to do eBooks or excuse me, uh, audio books as well. Maybe you should make some audio books and they should just be about you audio book reading the story of you making podcasts. So what it is, is it's not going to be a transcript of your podcast. It's going to be an audiobook about the behind the scenes to your podcast. Chris sat down in his chair he opened up Google Hangouts and he called. Naki was not there, but Anthony was. Chris you know, was alarmed. <laughs> Do you know who could read that? Lauren. I know. I know. By the way, a shout out to all of you on the Guinea Geek Network who are into voice work. There's, there's quite a few of you on there, and I know many of you are actually getting into to professional voice work. So kudos to all of y'all. But... Yeah. This is the time of the show where we like to move on to a segment, and this week, you're going to be happy to know that Chris has that segment, and he's going to tap that app. 
While you may know Chris loves phones, tablets, and other gadgets, did you know he's also a master tap dancer? It's time for him to combine the two passions in a segment he calls Chris Taps That App. Couldn't get away from the tap dancing, Chris. Couldn't do it. I love to tap dance, guys. What can I say? And I'm glad that it made it to version 2.0 of the Chris Taps That App bump. I'm really excited. (laughs) We're very happy to do that. So what are you tapping this week? So what I'm tapping this week, I'm going to the deep, dark world of Microsoft. And I'm going to talk about an app they have that I have just recently started using and gone, man, I wish I'd used this sooner in life and I wish I'd used it back in college. So what app is that? It's Microsoft OneNote, both the 2016 and the free app edition of it. So do you guys know what Microsoft OneNote is? Any clue? I know oh, yeah. that a lot of times I see it on my computer when I install Office. Uh, I know I've seen the icon a thousand times. I also know that my dad owns OneNote. So, uh, yeah. It's like one note phone or one like note like uh 3m like sticky I, I, it's a uh, sticky note is it a st- oh, you know, oh, branded sticky notes i know what it is it's a banking app because it's like banking notes right there you go <laughs> so, so so what is one note it's basically what it sounds like it's a app a tool for note taking and creation you can type you can use a pen you can clip things from the internet you can insert pdfs pictures videos audio files things like that. And you can also set it up so that it's shared with other people. And you can also use it for planning a lot of things. And I bring up planning because what have I been using OneNote for? I used a lot for show prep for podcasts. So we do a show called the Starling Tribune. It's all about the television show Arrow. I have a Surface book. So when Arrow is on, I literally take the uh, clipboard, which is the screen, pull it off, get my Surface pen out, and I handwrite notes about the show as I'm watching it so that I have those when we go to discuss the episode later that week. I also clip news stories from the web that could work as news articles and things like that to go in there. So I started folding into my show prep for podcasts because it's a convenient way to put them all in one place. I've also been using it to clip interesting web articles from the web, highlight things that are interesting, send them to other people and say, hey, you should go check this out. It's really cool. One of the things I've really started doing lately is I I like to dabble with cooking. I try all sorts of different recipes. I I like to think that I'm a fair cook. I have one notebook in one note that is literally all the recipes I want to try. And I've broken it down into separate tabs. I have ones that are like crock pot recipes, dessert recipes, oven recipes, stove recipes, things like that. And I go and use an extension they have called the OneNote Clipper on the web. And when I see a recipe that sounds like something I want to cook, I use that extension, I clip it, and I throw it into OneNote so that I can look at it later. One of the things I've really started using it for now, and this is what turned me on to OneNote because I needed a way to do a bunch of planning for something and be able to share it is, uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago that I'm getting married next year. So we've started planning for the wedding, trying to figure out caterers, venues, reaching out to people to get quotes on things. And I was thinking, what's the best way to compile this information so that my fiance and I can reference it and be able to have everything in sync? And I thought, well, we could do a Google Doc. And I started putting stuff there and that didn't work right. And I said, OneNote, I should try that. So I've literally made a OneNote notebook that has multiple tabs, one for venues, one for caterers, one for menu suggestions. And I've started putting all of that together. And the nice thing is I can give a link to that to my fiance. She can also edit those things, add to it, write her notes to, oh, this is a good idea. This is a bad idea. No, I don't want that being on the menu, things like that. It's been a great tool for us to be able to put our ideas for the wedding down on paper for lack of a better term and kind of hash it out and then have some discussions about it later. And I would not have thought of it had I not started using it for podcasts, but it has been a great collaborative tool in that regard. And as I was using it, I went, you know, this is a powerful tool. I wish had existed when I was in college because I can see where as a college student or a high school student, this could be really powerful. You can type in it. Like I said, you can also use the touch screen on any of the device you have to write and draw on it. One of the things that I really thought it'd be fantastic for was my electrical engineering courses in college because we drew out and diagrammed a ton of different circuits, broke down the math to figure out resistance on things, what the current is, blah, 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 electromagnetic fields, things like that. 
this would have been a great tool to be able to capture those diagrams, capture that math, and have it in a digital format where I could easily share it, make PDFs, give it to my friend who didn't come to class and, and be able to do things like that. And the real cool thing would be you could share that notebook with all of your classmates. So if you missed something, your friend could go in there and drop his notes in, or you guys could combine notes on things. It's kind of a modern day take on how to take notes in classes. And I find myself thinking, had this existed when I was still going to school, I would use this all the time. And it's a tool I wish I could use at work, but sadly I can't really take my tablet or my cell phone and take a bunch of notes and be able to sync them up with anything. While we have one note on the work computers, it's not quite the same. The convenience isn't there, but I found that OneNote is a very powerful note taking and collaboration tool that I kind of dismissed at first. And after starting to use it, I'm converting to it a little bit. That's cool. I, I actually got to check it out because it's something that um, I have seen it forever and I just have never looked into what it what it is. I, I honestly had no clue at all. I know you mentioned you started to use it a while back, but uh, uh, let me ask you this, though. Um, compared comparing the different versions of it because there it is available on mobile too you said right like on tablet that is correct that's what i was going to get into is all the different devices we could get it on so go ahead i could talk that and then we can go back cycle back to your question once we get through that so microsoft has made a big effort to make sure that one note is everywhere and the key in this is one note is also free for any of these platforms as well so where can you get one note from well if you're on windows you can get the desktop app of OneNote 2016 for free. If you're on a tablet or, or a Windows phone, hold your laughter. You can also get the Universal Windows app there and put it on your device. Now, side note, if you're on Windows 10, Universal Windows apps also work there. So theoretically, I have two instances of OneNote that exist on my desktop and on my laptop right now because I have both OneNote 2016 because it's a little more robust and has extra features. And I have the OneNote app for when I'm on battery and just want to take notes that have less impact on my battery life. Go ahead and get your laugh out about the phone <laughs> comment, Steven. <gasps> Windows phone. Is that even a thing? Dude, I think that was all made up. It was just propaganda. It's all just a dream. <laughs> it's probably the last app left available on the phone. <laughs> even then, it's like three generations old. <laughs> it's quite possible. So other places you can get this app on Apple OS's iOS, meaning your iPhone and iPad, you can have it. Mac OS, you can get the app, and also on the Apple Watch, you can get OneNote, meaning you could pull up one of your OneNote out, uh, notebooks, look at notes and things like that, and I haven't played with it myself because I don't have an iWatch, but I have seen some footage of it. And don't worry, Android users, you're not left out either. It's available for Android OS, Chrome OS via web app, so if you run a Chromebook, you can get a native app for that, and also Android Wear has a OneNote app. Now, I haven't played with it yet. I probably will try it out here in the next coming day, next few days. And then finally, if you don't want to download an app, it's okay. Just go to OneNote.com and you can access and update notes directly from your browser. It's Microsoft's effort to make sure it is everywhere. Now, the caveat is you'll have to sign in with your Microsoft account and it leverages your OneDrive storage space for any notebooks that you create. But by putting it online, it makes it so that if you open it on any device, you can access your notebooks. Okay, so that's really cool to hear the Chromebook thing, because we talked before about how Chromebooks could have a really good use case for people in the student, like students and in the educational um, type field and whatnot. And so I think that that's really good to see that Microsoft built a, a native app for the Chromebook, that's fantastic. And it shows that they are serious about that product. I think it's pretty much just a wrapper for the website, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I don't have a Chromebook to try it out. So I gave Microsoft too much credit. Well, you may or may not have. I can't confirm it, and I should probably research that a little bit better, and we can cycle back next week and see. Or if anyone's listening to this show or watching it, if you have a Chromebook, try out the OneNote app and let us know what it's like, please. Maybe you should buy a Chromebook just so that we don't have to, you know, Ask somebody dude, to do that. Dude, I just bought a Surface Book. I'm not buying a Chromebook. Ooh, that's fancy. Tease, tease, tease. I'm so glad to see these collaborative apps progress as much as they have because they weren't available when I was a student. If we had email to go back and forth to each other, that would have been great. We literally had to take 3.5 inch floppy disks back 
and forth to each other in order to transfer files back then. So there was no collaboration. You had to work on version control and stuff like that. Even, you know, the track changes in like a simple Word document became uh, very cumbersome. So what you have here, what you have with Trello or any of the other collaboration apps, way, way more advanced than a simple Dropbox, which by the way, I'm still rocking the two gigabyte Dropbox, at least with one drive, you get five gigabytes to start out with. So what has been your highlight from OneNote and uh, what's the low light from OneNote, Chris Farrell? So the highlight is it's become a pretty powerful tool for me able to share ideas back and forth, specifically with my fiance and a lot of wedding stuff, because that's what put me on this was trying to find that. And I have a list of pros and cons on that, and I can go through that. And the, the biggest con for me, and it's probably a minor quibble for something that's free, is if you use the OneNote app and OneNote 2016, it's very hard using the app sometimes to be able to open a notebook that has just been shared with you because it doesn't show up easily for you to find. And when that happens, I found what I had to do was open that notebook that was shared with me in the 2016 application and then pull up the universal app and it would show up there for me. I, I think it's just a matter of I was impatient and didn't wait for the app to refresh, but that's been one of my inconveniences. The other one that I'll touch on here is uh, I talked about the OneNote Clipper extension. So it's an extension you can put in Edge, you can put in Chrome, you can put in Firefox. And it's basically a button that sits next to your address bar. When you're on a website that has something interesting, you click that Clipper button and it allows you to take either the whole page, an excerpt of the page, or just an article view, which cuts out a lot of the pictures and stuff, and save that to a notebook. And before you do that, you can highlight things of interest and write notes in. It's a very powerful tool, especially for finding news stories and things like that on other podcasts. However, here's the real weird thing is this OneNote Clipper extension doesn't work like 20% of the time in Microsoft Edge, whereas in Chrome and Firefox, I've never had it not work. So there's some kind of bug with the Edge instance of the OneNote Clipper extension. And I don't know what it is. So it actually made me download Firefox on my laptop because I was doing stuff it wouldn't let me clip and that was the best way to do it okay so we mentioned the student possibility we mentioned the pros and the cons uh oh, this should naturally lead of course to how can students use this to cheat oh i'm sure they could use it to cheat i mean literally if you share it with people everyone could have access to your notes you could put together uh this isn't the right term but it's what we call them in school your little cheat sheets that's your one page study guides or whatever you're allowed to bring formula sheets and stuff into exams you guys could build a collaborative one in one note and have a super cheat sheet that you print out when you go in students are always going to find a way to cheat but the way i look at it is had it existed when i was in college it would have made it a lot easier for sharing notes in class for getting help with some things because i know there was some of the stuff that we'd work on problems on the blackboard and like my emag class and things like that where i'd be like what the hell did we just do here? I don't get it. And if you could put multiple people in the same notebook and be able to update things, help each other out, it'd be really helpful. And I know Microsoft is really pushing it for the classroom, especially with the uh, Windows 10 S laptops they're putting out and the fact that they're fighting with Chromebooks to get Windows laptops in the classroom. What is it like the $189 Windows 10 laptop they're selling to school districts now? I could see OneNote being a very powerful tool, especially for teachers too. I read some stuff on their website about how Teachers can have shared notebooks that are read only for students that are the notes in class that literally when they go to present in class, they can draw the notes on one note projected up on the whiteboard. And at the end of class, they say, OK, here's you guys copy of the notes. And if a student's having troubles, they can have individual notebooks or pages in a uh, notebook that's assigned to a student that only that student and the teacher have access to so that they can help them out. Like a student could start writing out what they're doing and the teacher could go, no, here's where you screwed up this math problem, fix this here. It's powerful in that regard. It's just a matter of adoption, I think, and getting people used to it. And in today's world, students and younger kids, they're much more open to technological solutions. And I think the younger group of teachers you have out there now, too, are also much more open to that. And it's a way to make these notes live forever in a digital format. And I think there's a lot of merit in that because... I know I still have stuff from college. I've kept notebooks because I said there's value in what I did in this. I might need it again one day. And there's a part of me that would love to be able to throw those out. But I have that lingering thought of I might need this. And if it existed as something digital in my OneDrive, it, it's negligible storage. I could keep it forever with no problem. 
take it from somebody that completed college three, four decades ago, those notebooks never get used again. <laughs> I know, I know, but there's some stuff I'm like, I could see where it would be helpful and it just hasn't come into play. I don't know. Maybe I'm a pack rat when it comes to some of that stuff. I've cleaned out a lot of my college stuff, but there's a good few. Man, good man. So I got a question for you, Chris. You mentioned the OneNote Clipper. Are they bringing back Clippy into OneNote? I have not seen Clippy anywhere. That doesn't mean that somebody won't do it because I read, I think on the OneNote blog that Microsoft maintains that the OneNote Clipper extension, they did make open source. So you could make your own instance of it that had a picture of Clippy in it if you wanted. Oh, I miss Clippy. Uh, One last note I did forget to say on here. There's a lot of people that use Evernote right now for collaboration and shared notes on the Android side of things. From reading Microsoft's website, they do have an import tool to bring Evernote stuff into OneNote. So if you tried out OneNote, decide you like it and said, oh, I've got a bunch of stuff in Evernote. I don't want to have to run both. You could theoretically pull it over. I haven't tried it myself because I used Evernote a few years ago once or twice and went, oh, this sucks and stopped using it because I was being a curmudgeon. All right. So one final question for you, Chris Farrell. Quest away. Why? Did you not share your wedding plans with me yet? Uh, I, I should have input into them. Because I don't want everything we register for to be podcast equipment. Why not? I mean, dude, this is your chance. <sighs> I know. It's ridiculous. Go for it. Ridiculous. I don't need more gear right now. I know I just blasphemed, but I'm, I'm comfortable with my current setup. I'm afraid if I add anything more, it's going to get unstable. I, I I'm think scared, more guys. I'm scared. Gear? What kind of a podcaster are you? All podcasters need more gear. I'm just going to say, Chris, this is an old saying. If she's not okay with the wedding list being entirely podcast gear, is she really for you? Is this, <laughs> it's just the say. It's an old, old adage. They all say it. Should have been a qualifying factor before you proposed. <laughs> Uh, hindsight 2020 i guess <laughs> I, I, you know i could probably put the stuff on the list and it wouldn't matter but i'm kind of comfortable with what i have and i like to play with new toys and stuff but i don't know if i need anything permanently unless i had a chance to try it out and then decide i wanted it that's true all right well thanks so much for tapping that app again this week chris we really appreciate you taking the time to do that and telling us all about one note and uh i might have to check it out and, and see what it's all about Before- well let me know if you want access to my gunna geek one note notebook can i deface Ooh. it yeah go ahead i don't care i can revert it back <sighs> that's not fun <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's just go ahead and go around the table and plug and promote and do whatever we'd like to do here. I'll go ahead and start us off and say that uh, I want to go ahead and sincerely thank everybody on the Gunna Geek Network. There's a lot of people on there right now, and uh, we're in the process of making some changes and uh, in the way that that we're going to look at applicants and I've had a lot of people step up and whatnot. And I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody over on the network. We're a tight community that a lot of people have a lot of fun with. And uh, everybody that is part of that network makes it as awesome as it is. So thank you to everybody who is doing that. The other thing that I want to give a shout, shout out here to as well is the gunnageek.com site. We don't have a lot of articles going on right now, but if you want to just have a little bit of fun and write some articles, feel free to hit me up. You can email me or tweet me. I just want to let you know that uh, if you are interested in writing on there, it is not paid. I will say that it's just geeks having fun geeking out. But if you want to go ahead and and write something and we'll help embrace that creative outlet, it's going to geek.com and just write me, tweet me, whatever. And we will talk as long as it is uh, not a bunch of um, profanity that you write on there. Uh, We once had SP write an article and that's all that it was, was all profanity. Yeah, but it was all about the Blue Yeti, so I think that was okay. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything that you want to plug or promote? Other than I want to promote the Blue Yeti, yeah, I do because wish. I love it, and it's SP's microphone of choice. The Blue Yeti, it's this thing. It is not, don't it? <laughs> the good news about the Blue Yeti is that there are some very open people, some, some open people in the society these days, and a lot of times... When they have an open relationship, one of the things that happens is uh, there is some form of adult paraphernalia that makes its way to bachelorette or bachelor parties. 
With Chris, he's already got the Yeti there, which uh, resembles something very horrible. So uh, he's set. He doesn't need that. Well, there you yeah, go. That's you, a good thought. You know, you just reminded me that we got to get out of here be- soon because you are going to watch The Bachelor coming out on the West Coast in like an hour. So you got to hurry it up. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> SB, what do you want to plug or promote? I actually have three quick plugs. First of all, Kent, who is on Art House Legends on the GunnaGeek.com network, just put in there that they did the Stargate movie from 1994. I recently watched that myself, and it was great to get back in the swing of things. I started a rewatch of the Stargate SG-1 series. Got a few episodes in, then got sidetracked, but I'm going to get back to that as I edit in the next few weeks, so that's pretty cool. I nef- definitely need to give a shout out to Bandrew Scott because in his latest Bandrew Says podcast, number 103, he gave me a heck of a shout out. So I would just want to throw a shout out right back to him. We're talking about the Blue Yeti. If you want to uh, review any gear whatsoever, go to his podcastage channel and you will see what he clearly thinks about this stuff. And if it's an older review, you got to ask him to update it because he might have a different opinion on it than he used to, but excellent place to go talk about any of your gear. And then finally, I just want to bring up the Cosmos series. I know I talked, touched upon it earlier, this podcast. If you haven't ever watched it, go ahead and watch it. It's a little dated. They did upgrade it, but it's a little dated. And then they did an entirely revised series with um, a person who should rename nameless because he killed Pluto. And then they're actually doing another season of that coming up later this year. So Cosmos series, if you haven't watched it, go get it and watch it. It's going to be great. Awesome. So that is going to take us to the end of episode number 224 of the official going to geek.com show. I'm Steven John Drew saying I retired a January 2016 overlay. MSP saying my assessment of this overlay will be coming forth in the future. And I'm Chris saying thanks to our wonderful chat room for joining us tonight. Love having you guys here. Bye. Thanks for checking out another episode of the official gunageek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always join us for our live recording sessions, which stream Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at www.geeks.live. And remember, you can find our full back catalog at gunageek.com forward slash show. If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on gunageeknetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week.